Hi, I'm Sunil Regge from PsychScene. Today I'll be taking you through an article that we published in the PsychScene Hub on COVID-19 and the brain, the neuropsychiatric manifestations of the SARS-CoV-2 CNS involvement. This is what the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. What we do know is that the genetic sequence that you can see in there, the RNA, it's an RNA virus, it's very similar to a bat coronavirus that was found in the Yunnan pro province in China. However, there are some differences and therefore it's possible that there is an intermediate host that hasn't been found because that bat virus doesn't infect humans. So that's pretty interesting. There's something, this is why it's known as the novel coronavirus. Now one of the important things in this particular diagram is those spikes, those red spikes that come out, the spike glycoprotein. This is a, this is a key spike that is used to enter into the host cell as we'll see later. If we think about general virus entry, this is how viruses enter the body. You know, viruses require our own human cell machinery to replicate. So not like bacteria, They're, viruses are acellular. So they'll use the host cell machinery, they'll hijack it to then replicate. So what happens here is, let's take the example of the influenza virus, for example. You know, the influenza virus uses the receptor, binds to it, and then forms what's called an endosome, a, a little nice capsule that takes it into the cell. And once it goes into the cell, the early endosome, it will then release its genetic material, which is the RNA in this case, into the, the cell, and then hijack the cell machinery and start producing lots of, either, uh, lots of other viral copies. And we'll see later how it then moves out through budding uh, after replication. This is an example of the poliovirus. You know, poliovirus um, attaches itself and the mechanism that it uses is poor mediated penetration. So slightly different. The HIV uses the CD4 receptor. So this virus uses a specific receptor to then enter the body uh, through, by binding to core receptor and then membrane fusion. So you can see that the SARS-CoV virus the receptor that it uses is the ACE2 receptor. So what happens here is the SARS-CoV virus, I'll call it the COV or the coronavirus, so just to make it easier. The virus enters through the olfactory pathway, so through the nose, but it can also, there's evidence that it can enter through the, the eyes. Now, once it enters, we know that the ACE2 receptor is situated in these olfactory uh, ciliary cells in the goblet cells. There's lots of ACE2 receptors. and the ACE2 receptor, it binds to these ACE2 receptors, but these ACE2 receptors are also situated in several other organs of the body. Lungs, endothelium, which is the lining of the blood vessels, heart, the enterocytes, the in intestines, and also the brain. And this is one of the reasons why the virus affects several organs of the body. What you can see here is, once it binds to this ACE2 receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme, to receptor, it results in destruction of these ACE2 producing tissues. Now ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme, is a really, really important enzyme, which really regulates our cardiovascular system. So if we look further, what happens is we know that angiotensin 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 on its own is harmful. It can result in acute lung injury, adverse myocardial remodeling, vasoconstriction, and increased vascular permeability, so leakage. Now what the ACE2 receptor does, or ACE2, the enzyme does rather, is converts angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1 to 9 and angiotensin 1 to 7. So these forms are actually protective. They act on a different receptor and result in vasodilatation. They're anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrosis, and also provide vascular protection. So you can see that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are used to modulate this particular pathway. So essentially, if we think about it, the coronavirus binds to the ACE2 receptor and results in dysregulation of this renin-angiotensin renin system that is modulated by the angiotensin-converting enzyme. Now what 
happens after it binds the ACE2 receptor. It uses that receptor to enter the cell and then hijack the cell's machinery to then replicate. So the virus will bind, it binds to this target cell, it will fuse and then create that endosome, that little nice capsule, it will penetrate, it will then release its genetic material, the RNA, into the cell. It will then use the body's own enzymes to replicate, produce multiple copies of itself. It will then use other aspects, other protein of the cell to create little virions, baby viruses. And they will then assemble in a nice package. They will bud and then release as a whole virus, lots of them go on to infect other parts of the body. So this is essentially what's happening in the individual cells after infecting them, after binding to the ACE2 receptor. So any cells that have the ACE2 receptor act as a target for the virus to enter and start replicating. Now the immune system after that starts responding to the virus. Now what we do know is that the, the phagocyte, for example, or the macrophage right at the start eats the virus. So this is the the innate immune system, it'll eat the virus, it will then take the viral particle, move it to the top, um, and then this phagocyte will then kind of present it to the first important line of defense, which is the, the T cell. The T cell, the helper T cell, will be activated once the phagocyte presents the viral particle to the T cell. You know, it's really asking for help. The helper T cell then will mediate that cell-mediated immune response. You can see what it does is it will present it to the T cell, the, the antigen presenting cell, as you can see there, and then a cascade will start. The first aspect that happens is there will be release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So there will be the T cell mediated attack that should kill the virus, the virions. The helper T cell will also present it to B cells. Now B cells, there are two types, the plasma cell and the memory cell. The plasma cell releases antibodies. So what you can see here, it produces antibodies that should bind to the virus and destroy it. The memory cells, and this is the principle behind vaccination, the memory cells will remember the virus next time and fight it. So one doesn't have to go through the whole casket again, it will remember it and then fight it. So this is the humoral immunity response um, that's occurring to this virus. But in some individuals, what's been seen with this particular virus is that it results in a hyperinflammatory response. Now this may be due to a few reasons. There might be a genetic predisposition to macrophage hyperresponsiveness in certain people, we don't know. Now there might be background inflammatory activity that is present which is why certain risk factors such as diabetes, for example, obesity are considered risk factors because they might be predisposing inflammation already present. High levels of cytokines. We know that uh, high levels of adipose tissue results in increased adipokines, which are inflammatory in nature. So the question is, you know, is that what um, results in an exacerbated hyperinflammatory activity? And then there's a trigger. In this case, the trigger is the, the infection. Now that results in increased macrophage activation expansion, it releases cytokines, the T cell gets activated, the T cell releases interferon gamma, which further recruits further macrophages and a cycle is set up. And this is what results in what's called a cytokine storm that is associated with increased mortality associated with this particular virus. Now one of the cytokines that's released that's really important is the interleukin-6 because some of the treatments that are being, that are being used is really to, to block this particular um, receptor, the interleukin-6 um, receptor. So how does the SARS-CoV virus infect the CNS, the central nervous system in the brain? There's a few mechanisms. If we look at the left hand side, you can see there's direct infection injury and the direct infection may occur through the olfactory pathway, but also through the blood. And interestingly, it may occur through the respiratory pathway as well, from the lung to 
the medulla, the medulla where the respiratory centers are present. And this happens through a process known as retrograde axonal transport, whereby you've got the axons and from the axons uh, or, or the axonal uh, sort of um, nerves, from the nerves it'll go down the axon and then from the axon to the cell body. Um, so it can move backwards from the olfactory cell, similarly from the nerves to the olfactory bulb, which is uh, situated in the forebrain. So that's one pathway, um, which is the retrograde axonal transport using the olfactory pathway, using the, med uh, the respiratory pathway, but also the intestines where you have the enteric nervous system. And then you have the blood, through the blood into the brain. But there's indirect mechanisms such as hypoxic injury using the ACE2 receptor, immune injury, but interestingly also hypercoagulability. So increased clotting resulting in young strokes, for example. Um, individuals uh, with, with strokes irrespective of, of age, pulmonary embolism, etc. From the central nervous system point of view, all this combined gives you syndromes such as infectious toxic encephalopathy, viral encephalitis due to inflammation, and acute cerebrovascular disease. So what are the manifestations if we group them? Encephalopathies, meningoencephalitis, neuromuscular disorders such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, psychiatric disorders, exacerbation of depression, and the depression due to host immune response or inflammation, possibility of bipolar disorder, psychosis, immunoreactivity, there are some cases due to exacerbation that have been noted. There is query behind the possibility of neurodegenerative disorders because according to the Brax hypothesis in um, Parkinsonism, you know, viral, a neurotropic virus can result in a prion type spread of that particular synuclein, exacerbating neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinsonism. Um, encephalitis lethargica was associated with uh, influenza, but there's some debate around it. But you can see that there's some possibility that neurodegenerative conditions may be associated with this virus. One of the key features that has come up is anosmia and ajusia. Loss of smell, loss of taste as a key feature to the extent where this has been included now as part of a screening tool. Next, acute cerebrovascular disease. And finally, infectious toxic encephalopathies, which can be due to hypoxia, metabolic disturbance, and systemic inflammation. What are the mechanisms I mentioned? Direct infection, blood circulation, neuronal pathway, the olfactory bulb, hypoxic injury secondary to lung involvement affecting the brain, neuroinflammation and autoimmunity. We've looked at ACE2 dime regulation resulting in cardiovascular issues, but also ACE2 is situated in the brain. Um, so this is what it looks like. You've basically got gut microbe translocation. You've got cytokine dysregulation, cytokine storm as well. So you've got lots of things happening at the same time um, with this particular virus. We've just gone through that. Enteric neuroinflammation was the other aspect I, I did mention. So you're basically looking at enterocytes, um, you know, and the releasing all these inflammatory cytokines and that then entering the brain through the vagal nerves. So that's the other important aspect. Now, some of the other psychological factors that we've got to think about is, you know, stresses during quarantine as well. You know, this pandemic has resulted in um, lockdowns and quarantine has impacts on uh, the psychological health of individuals. So some of the things that we are aware of is post-traumatic stress and avoidance, fears of infection, frustration, boredom, sense of isolation, fear of inadequate supplies and anxiety and anger. And one's got to be um, vigilant about some of these persisting over the long term. We've also got to think about the post-quarantine stresses and these include financial stresses due to prolonged lockdown resulting in, in losses of business or loss of employment, so job losses for example, and stigma due to people that might have had infections for example. Broadly immunological treatment options are really targeting the same entry pathways. So you can see here antibodies from convalescent plasma for example is one option, monoclonal antibodies um, uh, vaccines, you know, there's lots of trials for vaccines at the moment. You're then looking at specific antifusion medication like Arbidol. 
You're then looking at chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. There's a lot of uh, debate around its efficacy with or without a macrolide antibiotic such as azithromycin. And these are some of the mechanisms of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. It may reduce the glycosylation of ACE2, thereby preventing the virus from um, binding to the host cells. It may enhance the CTLA-4 expression Tregs, which is a, you know, helps with immune modulation. It may enhance antigen processing. So it does provide some immunomodulatory activity that might be responsible for its mechanism of action. And also finally, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine disrupts viral budding. We've also then got protease inhibitors such as ritonavir. And we've finally got the RDRP inhibitors that are RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors. So they prevent the virus from going forward to replicate. Some of the other aspects also include the IL-6 receptor inhibitors such as toclizumab and you've also got the IL-6 inhibitor which is siltuximab. You've got specific monoclonal antibodies against the CD20 receptor on the B cells such as rituximab and then which results in B cell depletion and then you've got the granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor inhibitors as well, such as Jimsu Limab. So these are some of the, uh, the antibodies that are you know, currently being, being trialed uh, and currently in use as well. Finally, what is the role of the psychiatrist in COVID-19? The important aspects are firstly, differentiating between what is an organic and then a functional psychiatric illness. Understanding the neuropsychiatric illnesses and differentiating the two. Recognizing the important aspects of psychotropic medication and the use of those in viral infections. The interactions between say SSRIs and protease inhibitors. The pharmacokinetic interactions. Also thinking about the neuropsychiatric consequence of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. The, the neuropsychiatric consequences of corticosteroids and interferon. Being part of a multidisciplinary team to manage the psychiatric and behavioral disturbances arising from neuropsychiatric complications. Advice on managing consequences of isolation in the so short term, providing tips, for example, providing um, short term mental health first aid, for example. Prevention, early identification and treatment of mental health disorders. Management of relapses of psychiatric illness in a vulnerable population during the pandemic long-term management of psychosocial consequences of losses, grief, bereavement, financial losses, etc. Post-pandemic psychiatric screening and surveillance of high-risk population, for example, health workers. And working with key decision makers at a systemic level to devise a meaningful response to an impending potential mental health catastrophe. At a systemic level, the psychiatrist can assist in prevention and data collection to design services to combat pandemics in the future. So these are some of the aspects where psychiatrists can play a really important role. I mentioned some drug interaction and choices. So here you can see SSRIs and retro, antiretrovirals. So sertraline and citalopram, for example, their levels are decreased by ritonavir. Mirtazapine may be used for insomnia and post illness cachexia. Tricyclics and duloxetine may be useful for certain neuropathic pain that might be persistent. Corticosteroid-induced neuropsychiatric disturbance may need to be managed. Importantly, QTC prolongation, we're aware with chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, combination with azithromycin, but if SSRIs are being co-prescribed, we know that high-dose SSRIs, particularly escitalopram and citalopram, can prolong the QTC. So I hope that this has given you a good understanding of how the SARS-CoV virus may affect the brain and the role of the psychiatrist within this current pandemic. Hope you found this useful. Take care and stay safe.